Well, it's a privilege to be here and such a famous spot over here. I was backstage and I thought I, I had to bring some experiments from nanotechnology with me, but unfortunately too small to show. So I bring you, the, I let you know the, what is nanotechnology and what it influences our daily life. Maybe not, maybe it influences healthcare, maybe the new computer, etc. And in, during my talk, I will give some impression about what are the possibilities, sometimes looking into the future, sometimes looking to the past. And I call this a uh, high-tech revolution because it goes very, very fast. We, we, well, if we're looking backwards, for example, I did, after a PhD, I was spent some years at Stanford University. And so now and then I returned to Stanford. And uh, so two years ago, I was there, I was driving the 280, and it was a self-driving Google car. I was like, okay, five years ago, that was impossible. You couldn't believe it. I said, I come to the professor at Stanford. He's 100 years old in January. He's every day in the lab. <laughs> yeah. And he's driving the Tesla electric car. Five years ago, it was impossible to do so. While he's not driving himself, he's not allowed for his wife, but the students like to drive in his car. And this is something that reminds me and the setting, okay, this is really going really fast. And maybe in most of the cases, it's because of we know so much more about materials, we know so much more about new technology. And one of those technology, the key enabling technology is nanotechnology. But before I tell a little bit more, I tell about nano, I want to show you how small it is because it's a broad audience. So here you see, the, it's the Earth, the ratio between the Earth and a soccer ball is the same as a soccer ball and the buckyball. And the buckyball are 60 carbon atoms just arranged like in a soccer ball. You see this. I could also explain a little bit different. When I, this morning, I shaved myself from one ear to the other. And when I arrived here, my hair has been grown 10 nanometers in this two seconds. <laughs> that is the size we're talking about. So it's really, really, really small. And if you look into the lab, what you can do, we can make instruments out of, out of well, it's uh, like 10 micrometer, it's 10 times smaller than the diameter of my hair. It's on virus, it's, it's like the computer, it's less than 100 nanometer. And the buckyball, you can make a tube out of it, it's the carbon nanotube, it's around about two nanometers. If you look into our daily life, in the building blocks, then we see that a cell is huge compare nanotechnology. A virus, okay. Your iPhone works in the same sizes of viruses. And the DNA is the same size of the carbon nanotube. So that makes us kind, we have a toolbox with all instruments and we can make objects in the size of the, well, of our life. In my case, I do that in Twente, University of Twente, uh, the Mesa Plus Institute of Nanotechnology. Uh, Twente, for those who maybe don't know, it is on the eastern part of the Netherlands, far away from Amsterdam. <laughs> it's only 160 kilometers, but it's just on the other side of the country. And there is a, a huge laboratory on nanotechnology. Well, it was invented, uh, you can see how many people work there, around about 600 people, scientists, work on the Mesa Plus Institute. And it's an institute with a lot of new papers, of course, a lot of citations, uh, almost 50 full professors and PhD students, etc. If you're looking inside the lab, then you see it's opened 10 years ago. Oh, no, no, less in 2010 by our king. And uh, only an intermezzo. If you ask the king to open your lab, you have to do something special. Not press the button, now it's open. This we were looking to something, how we can impress himself. And there was... Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman was one of the persons well, who invented nanotechnology. Because he gave a lecture, like here, and the lecture is called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And he asking the students, well, students, come up with an idea how I can put an encyclopedia or something on an hair. 
because there's so much room, there's plenty of room at the bottom. If we can do this, if we have this technique, well, then we can do everything. So what to do? So we take my hair and put text. And in, it's in Dutch, but it is like here right, the opening of the nanolab. I wanted to have his hair, by the way, of the king. So, but that was not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, uh, DNA or something like that. But then it opened. If you're looking into the lab, you, you're here visiting, then you see in the nano lab people wearing white streets. Of course, why? Because it's it's the dirt of our body who influence the, uh, the things you are making inside the lab. And uh, that's why you have these white shoes. The clean room is a very clean environment. This clean room is a special one to give. It's just one, one 1,500 square meters. It's built on concrete, one meter concrete. And it's on 360 pillars. And because it has to be vibration free, and why I hope to show you later on in my talk, because I'm building with atoms. So you can imagine if I put an atom on an atom, well, it puts in a shade. So it's really vibration free form. But and of course, no dust particles at all. Going back to nanotechnology, where it all started, it started with the electronics. So if now you open your iPad or something like that, you see something like this. All the transistors being very, very small. And in fact, since 1960, the computers, the first computers were, were, were built, and every 18 months, the computer got twice as fast and twice as much memory. And this is maybe you cannot see it from the back, but that continues, goes on and on. It's called Moore's Law. And nowadays, we are in a setting that the transistor is only, let's say, 10 nanometers or so. So the next maybe five nanometers uh, in, in two years, but it will end because suddenly if you go to the range of the nanometer, say two nanometers or so, then quantum mechanics says, okay, that's not possible anymore. So in future, and maybe in very near future, we have to think about another way to building computers. And on the end of my talk, I will try to give some ideas for myself, how we can build a computer that with less energy and even maybe smaller and faster than we have nowadays. By the way, this kind of chips, as you see here, has been made in, a, in, in Holland in ASML. It's a factory in the south of Holland. And so one machine, I think, is 60 million or something like that. So it's a very expensive ones. But you need those to make these very small transistors to get more transistors on one chip. In Holland, in Tomezzo, is we, because we talk a lot about nanotechnology and we invest a lot in nanotechnology. And if you hear, you see the uh, effect of the nano next NL, it's a kind of uh, Dutch approach to have uh, nanotechnology. And we try to look into new ideas of nanotechnology in Beyond More. So the new computer, on new materials, on the bio, and nano, I showed you that if you're looking to the DNA, it's almost two nanometers. So it's, you can look into the effect of that as well. And you, there are different techniques to make nanotechnology, and you have also the application areas. So what can nano do on, on food, on clear water, on nanomedicine, on an energy? So you can see now already what's been done here in this program. And one a very important part of this is called we call it RATA, Risk Analysis and Technology Assessment. How is the risk if you're using nanotechnology? What is the technology assessment? Do we accept nanotechnology or not? Well, if you look into this program, then I, I go very fast with it, but I want to show you a little bit about how this is going on on nanotechnology in a broad sense. So it's such a, say, in eight years, we have a lot of publication, a lot of citation, a lot of PhD students work on this project as well. This is scientific output, but on the other hand, you have the conversation. You have a lot of spin-off companies that origin from nanotechnology. Especially the lab, where we're from, the Mesa Plus lab, also we have 50 spin-off companies now 
working really on nanotechnology and making money out of the ideas I will explain later on. And what's very important, the RATA, the risk analysis and technology assessment, assessment is really, really important. We call it now safe by design. When we started the program, we thought, okay, risk analysis is analysis, so you make something from nanotechnology and afterwards you're looking to it and say, okay, can I use it or not? Is it risk or not? That's wrong. You have to do it in a different way. That we call it safe by design. First, think about what is the impact of this new technology? What can we work together? So you work together with different people to make a product out of nanotechnology. Well, this is a little bit an intermezzo. So let's return, in case, my place. So I enter nanotechnology working in a different field on superconductivity. By the way, this is a really nice podium to show you the superconductivity. It's been shown here for several times. And this is the, called the high temperature superconductivity. It's not that high. It's around about, say, 100 uh, uh, degree below zero. But what you see here is a, a superconductor. And on top of it, a magnet. And the magnet is levitated above the superconductor. And that was in 87 when it was discovered. And I was, was a student. I started a PhD. And indeed, we tried to make this kind of new materials. We need powder. And there was one famous guy at Stanford. <laughs> and this is the guy, the 100-year-old professor next year in January, was working on this kind of material. And at that time, I was doing experiments in the laboratory, and I was making this kind of nanopowder. What I did was like a chemical treatments. So I put some material in a solvent, citric acid. I heated it. It flames. And then after a while, the beaker was full of powder. This was really nanopowder. So if you look into this powder, and you're looking more in detail, you see this kind of powder. If you do it from titanium dioxide, you have a perfect power with a UV reflection. So this kind of powder now has been used in sunscreen floors, in toothpaste. And this powder has been tested a lot, if it's harms or not, eh? is it risk or not. But this is the most used nanoparticle nowadays, titanium dioxide. I will come to that later, if it's, is it harmed or not, because we have to do some testing about these nanoparticles. And I will show you later how we can do this as an example. Well, this is just made by ourselves, this nanopowder, but you also can look in nature. There's a lot of nanotechnology in nature. And one of the nicest examples for me is the lotus flower. This is the leaf of a lotus flower, and it doesn't come wet. Because it's greasy or so? No, it's not greasy. If you look into the surface, these are nanopillars. It's nanotechnology, what's in the leaf. And we can make this. We can make this surface with the nanotechnology. So you see the experiment. Oh, so I have an experiment. <laughs> so you see a droplet now, and just a droplet just drops, falls onto just a normal floor. Nothing happens. And now I have a nanotechnology floor. And now the droplet just don't touch it, it bounces around. It's not attached to the floor. So that is nice because we have these nanoparticles. We have a, a table floor, but we can also have it on textile. So textile doesn't get wet or textile doesn't get dirt. One of the examples is Thai. So old men can eat soup. So there's really a German company who makes ties with nanotechnology. <laughs> but there is another way to do so. And here you see the experiment about we half of the way is nanostructures and half not. And here you can see some coffee, for example, or dirt water. So the wall can be nanotechnology. So can you imagine? So in a hospital, you have a wall. You have a virus. The virus sticks to the wall. And a water droplet doesn't stick to the wall but doesn't stick to the virus and take the virus away. So with water, you can clean the floor, the walls, everything. So that's one of the application of directly inspired by nature. But not only the floor, you can also look to concrete. Concrete is a very, well, it's a very nice product, of course, but the iron in concrete, well, well you have to, can be oxidizing. So 
With this, we can make water polluted, water stunted uh, concrete for its surfaces. Now, if you go into nature again, and then you can look to, for example, carbon. I show you the big buggy ball. Yeah, that's the carbon buggy ball and the carbon nanotube. Well, if you make an image of it, and we can make an image, this is graphene. You've seen the white dots, it's the carbon, and this is the most strong material there is in nature. And we can make a tube out of it. And if you make the tube, and you can here see a drawing of a tube, this is really very, very strong. Nowadays, you can make, I know, not airplanes, but part of an airplane out of it. And when it was discovered in the late 90s, nowadays, there will be a lot of carbon nanotubes or multitubes, a lot of applications. So if you go into a shop, you can buy a tennis record with nano, or you can play golf with nano, etc. So we don't recognize it really as nanotechnology, but inside it's really it's nano. But it continues. Here you can see an example of nanotechnology in concrete. It heals itself, and now we are using this for bones, to heal bones. So the nanotechnology stimulates the growth of bones that makes it really something new and excited for using these carbon nanotubes. But how does our body react on nano? Tubes, we don't know yet, or we do, we do know, but we have to investigate that, just to keep that in mind. Well, anyway, if I show you, in the beginning, it was superconducting, uh, sorry, it was semiconducting uh, material, so the chips were made of nanotechnology, the money for doing nanotechnology came from, yeah, say, the semiconducting industry to make every 18 months your computer faster, twice as much memories, etc. And if you're looking now, how far does it go? Then I go to in the lab and I ask them, what is your new devices, what you have? And you see here, these are the sizes of the devices. It's just dust. But if you zoom in, you see an instrument that can measure almost everything. So it's in sets, it's almost unbelievable to, ex to explain. So here's a glass of water, so it could be my, my chip could be integrated in the glass of water. I come to someone and says, okay, how are you doing? Would you like a cup of, cup of coffee or a glass of water? And we know everything about the person. <laughs> because the chip is integrated in that. And then we can see, if you keep that in mind, now we're typing the impact of nanotechnology. And I expect, wow, well, the computers, Etc. No, the impact of nanotechnology is drug delivery. The impact of nanotechnology on health and in medicine. And how come? Because of the instruments, the tools we have in our toolbox are the sizes of viruses, DNA, etc. And we can make use of that. So let's go to the lab. Let's see what happens, what we can do. We can make nanoparticles but we can also put something inside the nanoparticles. For example, kind of medicine. Or we can make very intelligent nanoparticles. And we call it quantum dots. A quantum dot is a nanoparticle of several atoms. We put the atoms together. We are putting the atoms together. And there's too much energy in this particle. So the particle, when we have made it, well, it will drop to the ground state, and then it gives light, it shines light, depending on the material and on the size. So if we put these particles in a liquid, what we see, that the liquid shines light. So we have particles that shines light, and what we can do is making, well, an organic material or another molecule on the particle, and the molecule, the end of the molecule, well, attaching to, for example, the RNA from tumor. So particles are very active, shine light, and looking, if you put them in your body, to a tumor or something like that. So if we inject this kind of particles inside your body, then it will see if it finds in the RNA or in like a tumor, it will attach to the tumor. Not one particle, not 10, 
not 1,000, not 10,000 of these nanoparticles. It means that the tumor shines light. So if you have a breast a tumor in your breast and you inject it with these nanoparticles, you will see where the tumor is. So the people who want to well, take, take out the tumor can see it, not with extra machine or like an like like MR, MRE or something like that. No, directly with their eyes. But you're injecting nanoparticles in your body. What does that do? What is how they get away? Or do they destroy something in your particle? I'll come to that later. What you can do is also have this particle magnetic. And then if you put the same trick, you put the nanoparticles inside the body, you get MRI, very nice pictures because the magnetic particles show very nice resolution of these particles. And again, it's a contrast liquid, but then with nanoparticles. So again, what does this nanoparticles do? And luckily, there is a kind of way how we can well, exposure nanoparticles to, for example, to cells. And this we call, in this case, a lab on a chip. Here you can see an example. Here's a channel, and you see a liquid with all kinds of, the dots are cells. So every, now and then, every droplet has one cell in it. it and normally it goes 500 times faster than you see here. And the next we can do is we can merge two droplets together. Here, putz, you see. And then again, and now it's a particle with a cell, and the other, and the other droplets has over 1,000 nanoparticles. So the cell is exposure to nanoparticles. So you can follow how the cell, well, is he dying? How is he affecting? Also, this goes 300 times faster than you can see. So this kind of way really can see every single cell, how it works, and how it's affected by nanoparticles. So it's a very strong and a very important component or instrument to see the effect of nanoparticles. Well, we can give even that much further. For example, well, this channel is like an electronics channel, so you can also have the liquid, and you can measure the liquid, you can follow the cell if he's growing or not. Even you can follow your own blood, for example. And the next step, we call this a lab on a chip, the next step is that we put something like an organ. So with we can small piece of a lung or a heart, put this on a chip. Well, I have to do an example. So this is from the Weiss Institute in, in America. And so they, so they do some experiments with a lung. And here you can see that, for example, here you see at home, uh, our uh, platform, there we have kind of 46 organs we can test immediately. Here you can see the experiments going on. What is the idea? The idea is, for example, I have a kind of disease. I want to know which medication I needed. Me, not average, no, me. So they put a little bit of my lung, my heart, in this machine, putting all kinds of medication and see how it responds on this medication. So this organ on a chip platform is something we want, really want to, to address, we want to develop, and I think that's the very future of, of the future medicine in the, and for our daily life. So what I showed, so we can uh, see, for example, particles that attach to a tumor. We can have these channels who can follow your blood, for example, what's in your side of your blood. We know if there's RNA that we can attach a molecule out of it. Let's combine those in a nanopill. This idea came, can we measure colon cancer inside your body? So we all know that sometimes we have this treatment or you have to go to a hospital to test if you have colon cancer. But why not do the test inside your body? So take a pill. And in the pill, there's an instrument that can measure the RNA corresponding from the DNA of colon cancer itself. Well, there's quite a f just let's do the experiment now. So you take the pill, and the pill goes into your body. And if it comes in your colon, 
Then it will open and it will pump some of the liquid inside the pill. By the way, the pill has also a camera on board, so he makes pictures out of it, the surrounding, in that sense. You can see that RNA are, the, let's say, the red dots. So the red dots there, that you want to measure because there's an indication you have colon cancer. So you're collecting this for a few minutes, and if you collected this on these nanowires, then you heat it a little bit more, and because of it, it goes through an array of nano, nanowires, for, for example, the carbon nanotubes. So with the molecules that attach it, so if he sees that it's an RNA, it will attach. So suddenly the carbon nanotube becomes twice as thick, so the resistance is different now. And you can, you can measure it, you can put electronics inside the pill, who measure there is RNA or not. There is a sensor, and it will give a message to your mobile phone, and then your mobile phone is connected to, it gives your doctor, uh, the, the text message about there's something wrong with, this, with you, the colon cancer. So is this science fiction? No, it works. It works very well. If it's in the market, no, why not? Well, it's something like you really want to be sure that it's okay, that you don't test it and you get your mobile phone and you say, okay, you have cancer, and it's not. <laughs> And the other, yeah, because that, that's something that you don't want to happen. And the other way around, you will be sure that if he, me if he measures, that he measures, or if you have colon cancers, that he measures well. So there's a lot of testing now going on. And one of the tests we did was to put it in urine, not in your body, but only to test it. So in your urine, you keep the pill in the urine, and you look if it works or not. It goes fantastic. We didn't expect it, but it's really, this apparatus is something that can detect different kinds of cancer. So we're still working on the nano pill because it's very nice because you can measure it inside uh, the column. But on the other hand, you measure something that the urine testing about different, other different uh, cancer possibilities. So that's really a, a breakthrough and something that's kind of Friday afternoon experiment now becoming a really big company to explore that. But there's something we have to solve, because I said, okay, there was a camera on board, um, there's a pump, the electronics, where is the electricity coming from? You don't want to have a battery inside the pill. Why not? Because what happens with the pill after he's done his job? Well, you can imagine, hopefully it solves. So somewhere the energy must come from. And it comes from the body, the heat. These are the cars. The heat of a car you can see. If you're looking to the human person, you can see we are, well, temperature, temperature differences in our body as well. And we can make use of this temperature difference to get energy out of your body. It's called a particular element, but it's, it's something like, like we all know in the past, but now we want to make it on a nanoscale. Well, that's not that trivial. So you have to make a kind of well, layer, a very thin, small layer on a nanoscale. Well, well, this is not a nanoscale, this is a nanoscale. And has it be a temperature difference gives you some electricity, some voltage. Luckily, it is. It's possible, not with the, well, say the graphene, the garbon nanosheets, but there are different other and ceramic nanosheets we can make. This material is, is really ceramic material. Well, this, you know ceramics. If you drop it, it breaks. This not. It is flexible, like 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 paper. But it is insulating. There's no heat transfer into the material. So this is in a way to make this kind of material that gets, well, the energy from your body heat. The application, of course, you can see that the powder, you can tax in your body, everything is needed. Energy can get it out of your body heat. But I, uh, I explained it a little bit like, uh, okay, we can do this, we can do this, we can do that. Well, that's not that trivial, because you really have to make new materials, materials that doesn't exist in nature. 
because yeah, these kind of properties are well, yeah, it's, it's not like like uh, ordinary properties at all. So we have to look to a way to make new materials, and we use it with nanotechnology. And again, I told you already, this is then Richard Feynman, who gives this lecture, there's plenty of room at the bottom, what I show you with the text on the hair. But during this lecture, he says something else. He says, well, I think this, what if we can manage, if we can make atoms joined together, if we can make layers of different material we want to make. That are properties then of material that doesn't exist in nature. Maybe there's something really going on, exciting. Maybe it, we never could apply it, but anyway, it gives you new physics. That's what we're trying to do, because what he was explaining, it was if we have in Lego, and we have Lego bricks, then the property, well, it's not that interesting. But if we can make layers out of it, then we can make different properties. You can see in, in this direction, the property is completely different than in this direction. So the next few minutes, I want to go to a journey how to make, how to play with atoms to making new material. And in my case, we do it with pulse laser, laser deposition. So I go a little bit in the detail, in the technique, etc. Just hope to follow me because then you know how to make these new materials. How we do it with the laser. So this is the material. We need the atoms of this material. So we put a laser beam, a very high intensity laser beam, on the surface, and the surface then will be heated to a temperature around about of the same temperature of the sun. So the material then leaving the surface is extremely high temperature and is ionized. So if we're making a picture, we see this kind of ionized particles. These particles are just the same particles as from as we call the target. And now comes the trick because the laser is a pulse laser. It's not like like this one. No, no, it's like one hit, and every second the pulse is coming. So if you look into every second there is a pulse, so every second some material is leaving the surface, and if we condense the material on the, sur on the surface, on a new surface, on the target, on a substrate for example, then the material will be growing and growing. So every pulse we get some atoms, every pulse we get some atoms. And by putting another material inside the laser beam, we get different atoms. So, if we, here you see a drawing, so, uh, well, I, I'll show you, I have a, a moving. So there's a laser going on the target, and there's the plasma. So this one material, second material, one material, and second material. So we can make up this Lego block of different layers. You also see some of the, the, the dots up there, because we want to know if we have one layer or not. So we have to know how much pulses we needed for one layer. So we invented a kind of way of, of looking to the growth behavior of this kind of material. For that we need an apparatus to see how material is growing. So in this sense, this is the target, and this is the material where we try to deposit atomic layer. And here it is. But we also want to look to an atomic force microscope, a microscope that is scanning on a nanoscale how the material is organized on the surface. So now as he's scanning, now we took it away, and now we put some materials on the, mat on the surface, we bring it again, and we can measure now the surface on a nanoscale. Just so we have, I hope you can still follow me, but we have an apparatus where we can, with the pulse laser deposition, we can put on some material, and if we can see this material growing by this AFM. But there is another trick, because if we can shine our surface with an electro beam, electron gun, like the old 
television has. So if the surface is, is, is flat, then there will be a perfect reflection. If it's growing material, it becomes rough, so the reflection is not that good. So, in, in here you can see if the surface, I can show you here, if the surface is flat, there is, no, there is a perfect reflection. If the surface is rough, then there is no, well, the, the reflection is bad. So now you can see what we see. We can, on the bottom, we see the intensity of the reflection. And here, meanwhile, at the same time, you can see how the material is growing. And you see now it's one layer being grown. And now the next layer comes into play. And now it's halfway. And now it takes a lot of time. Yeah. And now the second layer is. So this, with this apparatus, we can exactly see if we have one layer of a certain atom. So we can stop and we can make the next atom an X material. What a long story. For what? Well, what the nice part is that we can put different material in this laser. So this is, okay, I can imagine maybe the other not the materials you learn on high school or a university, but this kind of material, this is a cubic material, different atoms, and it all has different properties. So sometimes it's, it's a superconducting, sometimes it's a metal, sometimes it's an, it's an insulator. And this material we can combine, so we can certainly we can make a material that is, well, it's 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 like ferromagnetic and diamagnetic. That doesn't exist in nature, but we can make it just by having this kind of, well, very well organized material. And this is a, an if you a TAM, it's a transmission electron microscope. Here you can see the atoms that's been lying down by the machine. And can we make this kind of new materials? Well, that's of course the question. This is, well, these are some ex examples. Here on the left, you see two materials. It's both barium copper oxide in here and strontium copper oxide. These are two insulated materials. We combine it and they become a superconducting, the best conducting material there is. This is in nature. We have to make it ourselves. And that also with the other examples as well. So this really a breakthrough in making new materials, in try to fixing materials, try to see how it works, how a new material can, uh, how the properties of new materials can be. Well, it's not that easy to make. Uh, you know, if I told you, okay, you have a laser, well, you know, you have an atomic force microscope, and you have an electron beam, etc. So combined is very, it's <laughs> a machine that, that, well, you need some. Uh, exercises to ha get the good material, but still though, it is a way to do so. For example, it's very abstract. I can, can say an example. For example, a glass, glass is, uh, is transparent, but it's not a good conductor. Copper, that's a good conductor, but copper is not transparent. But this ma machine, we can make materials that are even more conducting than copper and more transparent than glass. And this is our transparent electronics. And we can make that as thin as a coating. So it, you can imagine that in the future, your mobile phone or whatsoever is all integrated in with this kind of material. Material doesn't exist in nature, I'll say it again, but we can make it artificially by building atom by atom by atom. Now, one of the examples now, can we knew it, that was so, can we make a material that, um, well, if you flex it, if you, you move it around, for example, then it gives a signal. So if it's vibrating, the material, it gives a voltage. So when I was giving a, a, a lecture, then someone in the audience asked me, well, I'm working in a hospital and I'm looking to uh, no, tuberculosis. Is it a possibility to measure something that there's tuberculosis in the breath of a patient because you can vibrate it. So if it can attach to a uh, uh, tuberculosis uh, sample on it, it will, well, change your vibration of this, well, of this uh, wire. And let, let's give it a, a try. And we try, and here we can see we make artificial this kind of wires. 
So it can be vibrating, and if you look into Will, oh, this is drawing, this is really from the lab. So we make this uh, thousands and thousands of wires, it's only a one millimeter by one millimeter. That is the advantage of nanotechnology. And what you can do, I'll take some one wire. Here you can see the wire. And here you can see the wire with a gold dot. And on the gold dot, we have this molecule. In fact, the same molecule with uh, attached to the gold. And here, it's looking around, for example, if it's RC RNA, or it sees tuberculosis. And if so, then the vibration will be different. And we got a signal. And we got the signal in here. So this is the most sensitive well, apparatus to sue, and it can measure your, your breath. If to see if there is any, well, cancer or whatsoever. And the size, well, this is then the real. This is in a picture made it about the device, and this is again my hair. And the size is, uh, is no, not this, not this, but this size. So we can make tens of tens of hundreds of those sensors in a millimeter or so. And that now is to be putting together in an apparatus, and that is the idea that we connect it to your mobile phone, and really you can see your, your, your breath, if, if it's kind of a virus inside or not. And for us, it's a very important part, especially for the underdeveloped country, because, well, everyone has their mobile phone, and you can make your test yourself. So it's extremely important, I think, developments of an application of nanotechnology. Well, this is an example. If you go to the, the website, you can see in 2020 what kind of new ideas th uh, there are in business about measuring your blood, measuring your breath, measuring everything, almost everything. And we call this, and you, for sure you know, uh, the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things says that, uh, uh, well, we can measure everything. You can even measure if the milk is, is rotten or not. You, you really everything. But somehow it goes wrong. It goes wrong because if you're looking to how it, the energy will develop, then we are just in the beginning of the internet of everything. So we need energy for everything. And that's my message always to people we are using enormous amount of energy using our computer or how using this kind of devices. Okay, is that true? Let's, let's go. We go in a search. We do one Google search together here. For example, an idea is so you Google, uh, who's the guy? Dave Blank. <laughs> so you Google me. If you do so, this one search for the people here around, it's the energy of boiling two liters of water. One search, so much energy, yeah. So one Google search gives two minutes of a nine watt LED lamp. So I don't know if people have here some um, PlayStation, but if you use the cooling for out of the PlayStation, it takes only a few seconds and he is on fire. You can see, here it goes. So, so much energy is using by using a computer, by using a PlayStation, or even working in the cloud. That's why everywhere you see these cooling towers nowadays. So the Google cooling towers, also here in England and Great Britain, in Holland, and especially in America, enormous amount of this kind of, of cooling. Well, that sort of goes to an end. Yeah, but we have so much new ideas. For example, uh, yeah, artificial intelligence. Artific well, let's see, artificial intelligence. Oh, so, of course, the, we, maybe you, you read it in the, in the newspaper, the, the Google DeepMind AlphaZero can, can beat the, uh, the chat, the Czech uh, uh, world champion. Well, that already was 10 years ago, or even maybe 20 years ago. But this is different, because the machine learns itself in four hours. It's not the one who is using the computer. No, no, the computer itself tries to learn. And that it goes 
by learning itself, learning processes, etc. I think some are very enthusiastic about it and some doesn't, as you can see on the picture. And we can make use of this artificial intelligence all the time by, for example, looking to your, uh, if you to do the computer and you're asking, uh, well, who's Einstein? Eh? You see some pictures and so if you see so, if I show you the pictures and you immediately know who is Einstein. You immediately know all the other people, by the way. But so within a, th a tenth of a second, we you knew. A computer goes much faster. In a thousand of a second, he knows. But he needs more than 100,000 calculations to do so. So let's say, who is now, who is the young guy? Then we have to think about a little bit more. So say, say, say one second, we know. Again, the computer, one thousand, one thousand of a second, 100,000 times more calculation. And that is really the difference. And that's where it stops in the near future. We are using too much energy, computer, to use the computer, also with artificial intelligence. We have some very big computers, like here, the IBM. You can use it, you can calculate on it, you can go to the website and you can make a calculation out of it. And really, it's a really strong computer. But the computer can also be replaced by another computer, this one. If you look to the numbers, then the blue gene and the red is almost the same CPU almost the same uh, memory. By the way, we are around about 1,000 times better. I hope that you... <laughs> so that's... But if you look into the energy that the power is using, it's a million times less, of course, on the volume. So our brain is much more effective than a computer. So why don't we make a computer like our, that works like our brain? And is it possible? Yes, it is. You can put in, again, the nanoparticles with the, or with the uh, molecules, and if they attach to each other, it looks like a little bit on neurons and synopsis. So how your brain is working and you're learning continuously, we can do this in a black box full of nanoparticles. And we can train the nanoparticles to learn more and more and more. And at a certain moment, this black box is a computer can calculate, doesn't cost any and almost any energy at all. So if you have an in this artificial of this impression, the nanoparticles and on the on the left side, on the right side, sorry, you can see the first calculations being made just by nanoparticles. And what to my opinion, what's nice about it, the materials you have to use to this material are this complex materials, these layered materials we can make artificially. And this combines it that we can really make the brain, mimic the brain on a chip. This, to my opinion, in the near future, your brain and your, is on a chip and is beating than a computer. Unfortunately, it's not as fast as a computer, but it costs much less energy and the memory is much more than the standard computer. So what I try to explain this kind of, say, 50 minutes, is how nanotechnology will influence our daily life. So we have to be aware that the impact of nanotechnology can be huge. Maybe that's why you were coming tonight. And it's not only on data storage, it's not information exchange, but also on healthcare, but also data management and security robotics, etc. So everything is very important. So the important part is, well, on the risk analysis and technology assessment, is beware that the new technology, what is the impact, and we have to be aware of that. That's why in the, in the Netherlands we start a program, it's called Nano for Society. It combines all the ideas about what nanotechnology can mean for us, as human, for a country, for the world, etc. This nano for society has four themes. It's for health. Can we make 
the digital twin. So with the computer, with the lab on a chip, etc., we can make everything. We can mimic ourselves, not as a human being, but how we respond, for example, on the use of medicine, how we can make cells live longer, etc. Just so nano for health is a really important part. Next to health is the food and water. In the beginning, when we started the project and we said, okay, nano for food, people say, oh my God, no, no, no nano for food. But now much more, much more we know about the impact of nanotechnology on food, how we can make better food, how our body responds on food, etc. The third one is energy. I show you an example about making mimic our brain on a chip, but looking to new bat uh, batteries, for example, all the technique I use for atom making atom by atom, this kind of material are very suitable for new batteries. And the fourth is security. Security not only for military, but security also in our daily life. For example, the security of the internet, about encryption, for example, but also security in what does nano mean to you? Well, if you're looking to nanotechnology, I think I'd hope to show you what the effect of nanotechnology is, how we can work with it, how it influences our daily life, but also how scientists and other people work on to make it in a good way to, to look to what is the risk analysis of nanotechnology itself. Meanwhile, the ideas are extremely large and we can make well, we are just in the beginning of this high-tech revolution. And nanotechnology, well, in Holland, it is approved by our king. <laughs> so, and I have also to thank all the members of the Mesa Plus Institute of Nanotechnology who make it possible that I give this presentation about uh, what is going on on nanotechnology. Thank you for your attention.